It's not just any ordinary interview. It's one of the most famous professors in the world of psychology, Irvin Yalom. He's an emeritus professor of psychiatry at Stanford University and a psychiatrist in private practice in San Francisco. He has written some classic books that a lot, a lot of psychology professors use in their courses. And if you're a psychology student or a fan, you're going to love. And he just released his newest one, Creatures of a Day. It is funny and earthy and even shocking. But the nice thing about it is that it's honest and authentic. That's one of the things I like about this book. I love this original book, well, one of his books called Love's Executioner, as well as When Nietzsche Wept. Fabulous stuff. Well, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Yalom to the show. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Glad to be here. So this is a fascinating book. Before I get started on Creatures of a Day, which right now we have it, everybody's looking at it through the camera, it's superimposed here. They don't have to look at my face. I spare them that. Um, what got you started writing these narratives? Because they're really fascinating. Well, it, it, uh, it's been part of my uh, professional life ever since the beginning. You know, I'm working on a memoir now, and one of the things that I'm recalling was when I was in medical school, and I was first um, uh, 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 took my first psychiatry course, and I was pretty frightened by seeing patients, and then by having a team of uh, analysts around there questioning. Each student had to present to them, and they weren't very nice often to the presenters. Oh, wow. So I presented my first case, and I'd seen this one for about eight sessions, and I, I decided I'd, I just won't give a regular case report like everyone else. I'll do what's natural to me. I'll tell a story. So I just told the story of how I met this woman, and in my first session with her, the first thing she said to me was, I asked her why she's here, and she said, well, uh, I'm, I'm a lesbian. And I said to her, what's that? Uh, <laughs> this was, remember, this was back in the uh, 1950s, and oh, I wow. didn't know what the word meant. And I thought, I just might as well be honest and have her ask her to educate me. And it suddenly broke down all the barriers between the two of us, and she saw I was going to be honest and close, and I told this story of how I had worked with this woman. And, you know, it, they, they, for one time, the first time, the analysts didn't criticize me. They just said, well, they have, this speaks for itself. We have nothing to add to this. And, and so I, I've always been interested in writing and fiction since I was a young teenager. I've been, I read tremendously. I've always been reading a novel every day of my life, practically. I go to sleep reading a novel. So oh, wow. I love stories. Uh, I think that the, the narrative, uh, the case history, uh, which often has been disappearing from my psychiatric journals recently, I think still contains something that none of the uh, psychometrics, none, none of the descriptions of the patient really tell, but the case history tells so much. And I've seen some studies recently that, that students in psychiatry and psychotherapy who read case, who read narratives and read stories right before and, and then work with patients show that they, they have much more, much more empathy for patients. They display it much more. That's so, fascinating. You know, yeah, medical humanities is getting to be a kind of a fixture in a lot of medical schools around the country. And I've heard people speak in that field, and suddenly I'm beginning to realize what I've been doing all these years. Uh, <laughs> so I, all the books I've written, including the novels, are all meant to be teaching tales. They're all my target audience. Is sec is my, secretly, my target audience is the young psychotherapist. Of course, I love getting to the general public to read them, too, and people who are patients or should be patients or like to be. But mainly I'm writing for the young psychotherapists, and these are meant to teach them something about how to do therapy. I think it's fabulous. I think you're absolutely right. It's a great, great component. Um, before we get to the Creatures of a Day books, I, I definitely want you to start talking about that and telling us a little bit about what's inside and kind of tease us about that. Um, I found it very really interesting as well, reading books such as uh, Oscar Wilde novels, uh, Jane Austen. Yeah. Did you find those helpful? Absolutely. Uh, I, 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 in fact, I, I turn more to the older literature rather than the new. I feel sort of more comfortable in that. Yeah, you know, Oscar Wilde uh, is, is quite wonderful. Jane Austen. Um, so yeah, I, they're they're fixtures in my in my life. Oh, great. Uh, Dickens, Dickens especially. I read a great deal. And Tolstoy. These are all psychological novelists, and they know a lot about psychology. 
Absolutely. Well, that's good. That makes me feel better. Um, so your favorites are Tolstoy and well, we're not, Dickens and Tolstoy. Those are your favorites, or Dickens, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. Those are my, I think, my favorite, my favorite three. But I've got tons of other books I love. Oh, Dostoevsky, boy, you're going heavy there. All right, um, Doctor Yalom. So, Creatures of a Day. What yeah. are some of these stories that really stood out for you? Well, the title story is is a very interesting story. I think uh, the story. Because the story is a story in which I had been reading a philosopher, Marcus Aurelius. All all people in my field should read his Confessions, oh. uh, Marcus Aurelius's Confessions. It's it's just loaded with wonderful stuff for us. Uh, and when I was reading that, a patient, uh, I had a session with a patient, and he was bringing up some things about how he was working as an ad man and hated his work but had to do it because of his family and I I suddenly thought of Marcus Aurelius because he was a he wanted to be a philosopher and a poet and he was forced into being an emperor. I uh, guess it doesn't sound like such a bad job, but nonetheless that's not what he wanted to do and defend the Roman Empire against the uh, German hordes on the uh, barbarian hordes for all of his life, so he wasn't happy with his life. And I thought it might be interesting for him take a take a look at uh, Marcus Aurelius's book and see whether that would speak to him. And I also said that to another patient that I'd been seeing the same day, who, for another reason. And it was sort of interesting to see what happened here. And that's what the story's about. Each of the two patients got something. Usually they don't. Usually it's a harebrained idea when I tell a patient to read such and such. But these people <laughs> each got a, a good, learned something from, from reading Marcus Aurelius, but it wasn't what I expected them to learn. Huh. Uh, so, but nonetheless, it was interesting. So that's what that story uh, portrays. Uh, so each of these stories portrays some important incidents in psychotherapy that I think is is a is a teaching lesson for therapists. And that's what I love about your books because it doesn't seem like you just randomly pick stories. You have a purpose behind this. You have an agenda. It, I do. I do. Uh, and it's hard to find the next story. And as I get older and older, the waiting for the next story to pop up is taking longer and longer. <laughs> <laughs> so are they getting wilder and wilder? Has, in your opinion, has society, or at least the stories, changed over the last few decades? Oh, yes, it, it's, it's, getting, it's getting wilder and wilder. Every day I get uh, something from Amazon giving me, uh, uh, you know, there are a couple of free books or low price books they offer, and I get these every day of the year, and they'll, and, and uh, I asked for science fiction. I asked for literary fiction. Well, the science fiction book that they're offering for the last, let's say, year, 365 days, every day of the week, is an apocalyptic novel. And that is a novel which is dealing with the end of the world. Uh, these things are coming out in the hundreds now. So oh, that wow. sure means something. Uh, this is the kind of concerns that writers are, are having rather than the good old science fiction days where they were actually talking about more human concerns. And one so, of the things about your books, it doesn't seem like you tackle very many Axis two disorders. Is that correct? Most of them are Axis one, more of the general population type? No, I, I, no, I really don't. These are, are you know, in, in, I did a lot of work as a psychiatrist. I ran the Sanford inpatient ward for many years and worked with psychotic patients. But in later years, I'm more interested in existential conditions. I, I have not been working with psychotic patients at all. I am working with people who are facing uh, issues in life that we, that we all have to face. I, I like that. That's what I like about it. In, in the book, uh, Creatures of a Day, did you touch upon anything in regards to groups? Because I know you wrote a famous book, uh, Theory and Practice in Group Psychotherapy. No, I, I haven't. As I recall, I haven't done that. Yeah. In, the, in that book, uh, in in a book, another book of stories, which uh, is actually is not read as much as my others, but I really think it's my best book. is called uh, Mama and the Meaning of Life, huh. uh, and there's a there's a long story in there of a woman who was instrumental, a patient who was instrumental in helping me form a lot of groups for cancer patients. So there's a very interesting detail story about forming these groups and what these and what we all can learn from people who are facing cancer 
Yeah, definitely. It does change the dynamic, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. And keep in mind, too, that I wrote a novel called, um, let's see, The Schopenhauer Method, The Schopenhauer Cure. Oh, yeah. The whole book is written around a psychotherapy group, and I follow the various meetings uh, of that group. So if, you, if you're a young therapist, you want to learn about running a group, read my textbook, but read this one, too. It's much more fun. <laughs> now, this one deals a little bit, it seems like, with mortality or aging. Am I correct on that? I beg your pardon? Uh, the Creatures of a Day seems to also deal yes, a little bit. Yes, with... a lot. A lot about, most of the patients, patients here are much older than the ones in those executioners. Uh, okay. So that, yeah, that, does, that definitely changes the, the uh, feel of the book. Um, anything here that stood out for you that you want to share with us in regards to mortality, aging, any kind of theme that you found that was surprising? Well, I have I have patients in there who uh, who are aging. One of them going into a retirement home, another uh, dealing with a fatal illness, uh, and uh, teaching us all something about how how to die. Uh, uh, talking about uh, some dreams that dreams that may be dealing with end of life issues. So there is uh, there is an emphasis not not solely. There are other patients, other stories that are not like that. But they, they're teaching us something about uh, facing the vicissitudes of aging and, and uh, facing death, which, of course, unfortunately, all of us have to do. Yeah, we haven't figured out how to get around that one quite yet. <laughs> no, we haven't figured out. We have gotten, a, have gotten around to, to knowing how to deal with death uh, a lot better. And I've, and I've spent a lot of time working on that in my book called Staring at the Sun and a book called Existential Psychotherapy. And we can learn a lot. I, I decided I really didn't know how to write this textbook on existential therapy because I thought the most important of the existential issues we have to work on in our, in our therapy work is, is death. And yet, and yet I can't get patients to talk about death. You know, my average everyday patient, I didn't know how to do it then. I do now a lot better. So I just turned to a study for the next several years of working with the dying and what they can teach us. And they can teach us a, a tremendous amount. Mainly they can teach us that uh, that uh, you don't want to come to your last days in life just full of regrets for the things you haven't done in life. Mm -hmm. uh, that, the, that, that you want to, you, you, you fear death a lot more if you've got a lot of unlived life inside of you. So the idea is how you live your life as fully and decently and lovingly as possible, I think, is, is part of the answer that comes from that study. I love that answer. Dr. Yalom, we have a couple minutes left. Um, do you think the therapist needs to have a good grasp on his own mortality to be able to help others? I, I absolutely do. That's exactly why I've written that book and several, several of the other books are all dealing with those issues. There, there's a, a, a very good story. It's one of my favorite stories, but everyone thinks it's, some people think it's kind of loony because it's got a talking cat in it. But in the meaning of the Mom and the Meaning of Life, there's the Hungarian cat curse. And it's a story about a cat who's coming to the last of its nine lives. And I think that story can teach you a lot, too, about life and the way the therapist helped that cat face it, his ninth and last life. Interesting. Mama and the Meaning of Life, I'm going to have to give that to my class. It's an extra credit I'll do assignment. It. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds great. I'm reading over all my books again because I'm writing a memoir. So I've been reading all my books over again. It's kind of fun. I haven't read them for 20, 30 years. Oh, and the one that stands out in my mind is Mom and the Mini of Life. There's a lot of good stuff in there that I'd forgotten about. <laughs> You're proud of that one, it sounds like. I'm proud of that one. I'm <laughs> proud of that story of the Hungarian cat curse. <laughs> uh, Dr. Yalom, uh, I have to ask, where did you get the name Creatures of a Day? A Creatures of a Day is right out of the Marcus Aurelius. And the, the first part of the phrase is, we are but creatures of a day. We're only creatures of the day. In other words, huh. it's a treatise on, on uh, being evanescent, on bringing uh, that, that we're all transient. Uh, on the passage of time. So in a, in a sense, it, it, Marcus Aurelius' work is meditations on, on life existence and on death. So I've taken, that, I've taken that phrase from him. That sounds fabulous. I love that. 
I'm going to make sure uh, we're going to superimpose the book here, Creatures of a Day by Dr. Irvin D. Yalom. It's Y-A-L-O-M. A must read. I would actually recommend all of them. Love's Executioner. Another one that seems to be coming up back again is Mama and the Meaning of yeah. Life. When Nietzsche Webb, Schopenhauer's Cure. I can't even continue. We don't have enough time to name them all. Dr. Yalom. I know. <laughs> Creatures of a Day just came out in paper last week, though, so it's more, it's more affordable right now. Creatures of a Day? Yeah. Absolutely. And Dr. Yalom, where can we get more information about you if people want to learn more about you and what you're doing? Oh, well, uh, go to my website and read my memoir, which will be out in about a year and a half when I finish it. Wonderful. And the website is just Irvin Yalom? Yeah, Yalom.com. Yalom.com. Perfect. Thank you so much again, Dr. Yalom, for doing the interview. We truly appreciate sure. it. Very welcome. Thanks for inviting me.